really don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm just <laughs> good at winging it. Well, we think you do. As long as we think you do, that's all right. <laughs> All right, we're doing chapter eight homework. <laughs> we can pass them around the table. <laughs> Oops, sorry. All right. Uh, Chris, you want to start? Sure. The primary controls on most recreational boats consist of the sea steering gear throttle and shift levers. Yep. The most basic throttle control on small boats is the seat, lever, and rod system. Yep. Is that right? Yes. Chapter system. I mean, um, paragraphs. It, paragraphs. So, I do have a question on that one. Yeah, um, I do. <laughs> because when I went back at it, I looked at, um, on chapter, uh, paragraph six, so the most basic engine engine control for the boat throttle consists of a simple lever and rod. But then on seven, the most common throttle control on a small boat is the push and push fire and cable. Right. Yeah, so that's what I meant. Oh. Mm. Yeah. So that was that's right. A bit. That's right. Where are you seeing that? Right here. Right right seven. Seven. You see right here. Right yeah. right. The most common yeah. I know. <laughs> throttle control. I know. I didn't like that. Oh no, that's the basic, most common. Basic most, versus common. It, yeah. Oh, it's basic versus common. And small. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Basic is in, in paragraph six. So basic is yeah, simple. that says most common. common. The question is most basic. <laughs> but well, also on seven says on a small trick boat. question. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. that's the question. But it's literally the first yeah. sentence in paragraph six. Yeah. 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 That's that's the push 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 it out. So is it C or D on the test? It's C. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it is C. It is <laughs> kind of technicality. Yeah. It's it's the question is the most. Well, the question is the most. Most basic, uh, not the most common. So, secret word is basic. But unfortunately, they do, they do that kind of stuff on the desk. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's okay now. <laughs> so this yeah. What do we need? 60%? Yeah, we have it. Yeah. 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 Uh, my <laughs> I want to say no, I got right 70. here. It's either 70 or 80%. I'm not I thought it was 80. No, I'm I believe it's 80, yeah, right. but. Okay. Uh, are, we, are we back to the home? Well, I've got yeah. a pretty I've got a pretty good track record of everybody <laughs> passing. So guys, don't screw it up on me. <laughs> What's the word here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't ask questions like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, instruments and gauges which measure engine performance and or condition require B, sensors or transmitters. Or fuel level gauges on boats are B, notoriously inaccurate. The two most important instruments to closely monitor on a boat are the B, temperature and oil pressure gauges. Yep. Right, the marine tachometer indicates engine revolutions per minute B. Speedometers on a boat measure D speed through the water. Yeah. Eight, most recreational boat instruments are operated by electrical current A. Did, did, did you, oh, did, 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 do you know what paragraph that was? Because I couldn't find it. Oh, uh, I, I did put it, I did put it. 21. It is 21. I thought I had. All right. Dave was the right answer, right? Yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, nine, bolt meters used on boats monitor the electrical system's condition. Let's see. Engine synchronizes uh, D, part of the trim angle control mechanism. Put it. Put it. Put it. Put it. Put it. The um, synchronizers basically are tied in with the tachometer. The synchronizer basically matches engine RPM. Uh, the boat's hour meter indicates Greenwich Mean Time. 
Uh, it's hours of engine operation. <laughs> they had us all think. Everybody thought they had it wrong. <laughs> no, you're thinking, I was thinking, is he really that clueless or is he being funny? <laughs> Uh, visual alarm signals should be mounted in the skipper's line of sight. T. Trim tabs are used to B. Correct the boat's attitude. Boat has attitude. Mine certainly does. <laughs> that's, that's a good name for a boat. <laughs> 14. Rudder position indicators are most valuable when maneuvering with little steerage way. Yeah. Is attitude an actual like term of art that that power butters use? Um, I mean, it is. A, it's a term. I know it from this course, but honestly, I, it's not something that's commonly used. Yeah, versus the author. Basically, uh, you know, it's attitude. Their type versus bow up, bow down. Yeah. So you guys don't say like the attitude is bad. No. <laughs> no, we've been known to say that, but we're not just referring to the trim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the trim is bad. Our boat is all got bad attitude. It's a fix the attitude. <laughs> all right. So there was uh, any any uh, any other questions or anything on that chapter? <coughs> This time. I'm going to get into chapter nine, and then we'll do. Then we'll go over the homework from chapter nine okay. afterwards. I don't know if, if, if how, how many did the homework for nine, but we'll, uh, because those who didn't, I'm going to put you on the spot and make you answer the questions anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> you better mark them as you go. Be right you like it? <laughs> Marine steering systems. Uh, boats are steered by deflecting the flow of water as the boat moves through it. You may want to remember that. Um, that's question yeah. number one on the test. Yeah. And unfortunately, <laughs> is anybody that's any of you guys that have inboards um, are probably well aware that when you're in reverse, the water flow is not flowing. You're not blow, pushing the water over the rudder. So <coughs> trying to steer in reverse is often uh, cross your fingers and hope it goes the way you want it to. Um, so we don't even bother with the steering wheel. Right. Yeah, well, if you have a single engine vessel, then yeah. you don't have a lot of options. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that screws up the camera. Uh huh? Nope, we're good. Uh, Whose phone was that? Was that my that phone? Was, no, that was mine. Oh, okay. Obviously, it's my wife. There's one phone oh, ringing after you. Yeah. One's my work phone. <laughs> one's the. Uh, well, she knows you're here. You should answer it. Uh, she knows you're here, right? You should answer it. Yeah, yeah I'll take a break in a bit and call her. But I'm sorry. I have an issue with with courtesy with cell phones. And <laughs> I'm not going to stop in the middle of class and answer a call. Even for his wife. Um. <coughs> all right. Uh, all right. We're going to talking about the stern-mounted tiller, or tiller and rudder. And this is one I'm going to. This I'm going to basically give you an answer that's probably on the test. That seems to be a very big confusion on. Is a gudgeon is the socket that the pintle fits into. 
that seems to be and and um, beyond that, I mean the pintle and gudgeon are basically the point where the rudder is attached to the boat that allows it to pivot. Um, I kind of point that out because that seems to be a, a stumbling block. <laughs> yeah. Well, my wife is into canine nose work and dog. Everybody says, I can't believe you have that ringtone for your wife. <laughs> it's not for the reason you think. <laughs> She's a huge dog person. So. Oh, that is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they show, if you look at Figure 74, you can see the, the show the pintle and the good one. Um, and then there's a generally the, uh, there will be a, a cotter pin through the pedal to keep the rudder from being able to float up. And this is generally in small, you know, small sail loads. Well, they, do, they have them on large full keel sailboats as well. Do they have that that same setup though? Oh, yeah. The, where the, yeah, the pedal and gudgeon. Yeah. Yeah, did they have? Yeah. Yeah. I stand corrected. This friend of mine has an 38 foot Alden, 39, 1939 Alden, pedal and gudgeon. Yeah. Yeah. Because the rudder is on the back of the keel. Oh, okay. um, and then they um, they talk about a uh, in the rudders we talk about maybe the next the figure 75 they're showing a balanced rudder and by basically moving the location of the pivot post, the, wa the water flow will be acting on both in front of the post as well as behind. So if you have a relatively, well, basically, if you put the rudder post right in the middle, um, the rudder would pretty much it wouldn't it would not correct itself to straight ahead any longer. It would wherever you put it, it would stay, because you would have equal pressure pushing both sides. Mm -hmm. um, what they call a semi-balanced rudder um, is going to be it's if you're moving through the water and you let go of the rudder, it's going to tend to want to go back to straight ahead position. Um, but it, it, whereas if you have a unbalanced rudder, it's gonna it's gonna very strongly want to go back to that straight ahead position. So I mean, ideally, you probably want a, like a semi balanced rudder so that it wants to go straight ahead, but you're not gonna have to kill yourself holding it there at any speed. But that's the purpose of those different configurations largely has to do with um, steering effort versus being, I'm saying self-correcting, but the tendency to want to go back to straight. On other than the Pintle and Gudgeon, um, rudders generally you're going to have a stopping box that, where they go because generally you're going to go, there's going to be going through the hull at some, some point. Um, and similarly to the stuffing box for your drive shaft for the propulsion system. It requires frequent inspection, uh, and 
unlike the pro the propeller shaft stuffing box, the uh, stuffing box for the rudder, you generally don't want to see much, if any, leakage. You know, we talked before how you get a certain number of drips from the engine. Mm -hmm. um, well, the stuffing box or the rudder, if it's um, if it's leaking, you want to hopefully just snug up on it a little bit. And, and otherwise, you're looking at having to have it repacked. I was confused when I saw the picture because I had heard of the stuffing box, but I had never actually seen it. I was picturing a box. Of, I mean, it's literally it's just stuffing. a bushing. Yeah, it's a bushing. The old a, days, it was a like a wax rope. I don't know if you remember the old. It was basically the same thing they used in Silcox or you know house faucets years ago, and it was just a wax rope that yeah. would act as a seal. And as they wear, you just take a pair of pliers and snug the even on the even on your uh, faucets. You just snug that nut down a little yeah. bit and it would stop. Yeah. Nowadays they're pretty much all O-ring type seals, mm -hmm. so. You know, a lot of them, they a lot of them are not really. You, know, you can't adjust them like that. If they start leaking, you have to replace the seals. But it doesn't mean if you've got older boats that a lot of them will still have the the packings that you can tighten. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like um, we talk about the. You were talking a little earlier, like the, the drum, the drum and cable steering, the pull pull cable that, you know, a couple, all oh, the, you know, they, they don't use that anymore. Well, I myself still have two boats that have that, and I like it because, you know, it's worked for forty or fifty years, and it still works just as good as it did when they, the day it was new. You know, there is there is something to be said for simplicity. Actually, we'll get into that now. The, um, there are um, basically, well, this is what I, I was just talking about in here. They say there are basically two types of steering systems in use today rotary and rack and pinion. And as I said, there's still a fair amount of the old pull ca cables out there, too, but. Um, and the rotary, they show a rack and pinion setup. And basically, it's a single heavy cable that is attached to a gear and a rack. So when you turn the steering wheel, I'm looking at figure 78, that gear pushes that steering, the, the big long rack, back and forth. And you see that. Something might be serious. Yeah. She keeps calling. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so anyway, that um, that rack or the the straight that straight piece with the gear gear teeth on it. Obviously, as you're turning the steering wheel, it's going to push that back and forth, and that is attached to the inner inner cable. Um, and it, that these are a it's again it's one thick cable with a thick outer casing, so that when you steer when you turn the steering, obviously the inner 
inner cable is going to move back and forth in relation to the outer casing and so therefore it can you can have five feet or 35 feet of cable and you're going to have the same relative movement at the other end of the cable in relation to the casing so normally at the stern at your uh, where it's attached to your rudder or out drive or whatever um, the outer casing of the cable will be fastened to the hull and the inner piece of the cable will be attached to the rudder mm -hmm. so basically you're transferring that movement mm -hmm. and because the inner cable is trapped within that outer housing you can make it go around corners um, the you know, the only downside to that that I see to that type of system is the fact that you can't see that inner cable. That inner and they do you know they can start to rust, fatigue, fray. You're never going to know. You, there's really no way you're going to know it, and there's no practical way of inspecting it. You know, from the factory, the ends are crimped on. You can't take it apart. The only thing is you just pay, you have to kind of pay attention for a change in the feel of the steering is usually the tip you've got that mm -hmm. that cable's getting worn. Mm -hmm. They're not overly troublesome. I don't mean to insinuate that, but it just, you know, the drum and cable system that we'll talk about shortly is all exposed. You can see the cables. Um. So is there usually a, a, a specific gear ratio between the pinion gear and the racks so it's not literally There like are different ratios. One for like, one? Uh, okay. Yeah, they're not one for one. Normally okay. it's the... Uh, yeah, because otherwise you'd be like, you'd be squirrely. Um, yeah, there are, I don't know what, what the ratios are, but okay. I know there are different, okay. you know, if you have a small, um, you know, performance boat, you're probably going to have a quicker ratio where you get more turn with less than you are on a, like a big cruiser. Okay. Um, then the other stuff, the rotary steering helm, it works in the exact same principle. You've got a pinion gear, but what they're showing that what they're showing here is a rack. I don't. I thought there was a diagram in here of a rotary steering gear, but I don't see it, and I could be wrong. I don't think there is. But basically what they've done, instead of being a solid piece, a solid piece with teeth in it, is the, ca the cable will actually be notched to mesh with the teeth in the, oh, okay. on that gear. Yeah. And then the cable will coil up into, so the cable will actually will wrap right around. So instead of seeing that rack and pinion steering, you've got a rack about this long under the dash. Whereas on the uh, rotary type, you'll just have a round, the cable will go into the bottom of a round piece about that big. And the cable literally winds inside that. And usually there'll be a little, tail sticking out the end for the cable to come through. So instead of the cable being attached to a rack, on the rotary type, the cable actually is meshing with the gear. It basically works exactly the same. The reason for the rotary one is space. In smaller boats, you don't necessarily have room for that rack. The downside to the rotary type is inherently is not quite as strong or resistant to wear because now you're you're actually engaging with the cable and running it around the turn, you know, moving it through a radius. Um, and generally, the the uh, rotary type, the cable is part of that rotary gear unit. You can't you can't replace just a cable. You have to replace the whole thing. Whereas the rack can go either way. Some of them are all one piece. Other ones you can actually disconnect the cable from the steering from the helm and replace it. Did you say the rotary the cable on a rotary is 
spectrum is not the match pin here? Mm -hmm. Did you say that the cable on the rotary system is notched to match the pin here? Yeah, it's the cable, and I say cable, but the end of the cable will be, it's not a braided, the first two feet of the cable is not braided. It'll be made out of a, oh. um, could be a nylon material, it could be, I, I'm not I, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what they use, but it's something that they can actually cut teeth into it so that it engages with that pinion gear. Like I said, it, it's basically just like the rack and pinion setup, except it's flexible so it can it can curl around. It doesn't move along linearly. It wraps around. Yeah, it basically goes around the along the spine. Yeah. And then uh, the other types of steer, the other, I mean, those are your basic types. And now, if you want to upgrade, um, most steering systems are available. A lot of steering systems are available as what they refer to as a no feedback system. Um, and Basically, the purpose of the no feedback system is to counter when you're in various throttle settings, um, whether you have an outdrive or a rudder, this different amount of torque trying to turn the steering, depending on the speed of the water rushing across the rudder or the amount of thrust from the propeller. Um, if you take, well, if you take a, a um, particularly like an outboard, because on an outboard you also factor in the torque of the engine. But when you go to accelerate, you know, for example, a lot of boats are going to want to go to the right. You have to put a little more effort to keep it going straight. The no feedback system cancels that tendency. And I know I did a lot of experimenting with that when I had said last week I had an old OMC stern drive, old electric shift. And it was, you know, there was no hydraulics, there was no, the, the trim was an electric motor. It was either down or up. There was no power to run out. This was the early, early days for, for those. And one of the things that that got fierce torque steer, again, when you, get, when you were cruising at various speeds, some of it was self-inflicted because once again I had stuffed a way bigger engine in that boat than it ever came with. But that aggravated the torque steer to the point where you had to really hang on to the wheel. And they have a, most outboards and most stern drives have a trim tab that literally it's, you loosen it and you adjust it. It's usually right behind the propeller on the cavitation plate. There's a little, um, like it's like a little mini rudder. And that's its purpose. Is if you get a lot of, you know, if you get a lot of that torque steer, you can adjust that one way or the other to alleviate it. But I found the problem I found is I could alleviate it at full throttle, but then I'd have at lower speed at cruising speeds I'd have it ten and one to pull. It was you could never get it so that it was good all the time. It was always kind of find the happy medium where it only pulled a little bit each way. Um, but that's the, the, first, the no fe feedback steering systems um, supposedly counteract that. I am saying supposedly because I don't have a lot of experience with them. But I, I suspect it has something to do with the rack, the way the rack's set up, that it makes it harder for the cable to push the stick to turn the steering wheel. Um, then we get into they show in figure 79 like I said is one of my favorites the old the pole pole cable very simple um, 
you just have a rotary drum on the steering on the end of the steering shaft and cable going around each side of the boat the as I said one of the beauties of that is simplicity it's all in a small and again in a small boat like that which is where the that's that's where these systems are good for is a small you know 14 16 foot runabout where everything is exposed um, the other thing is kind of it's kind of neat about the pull pull cable system is as they show here the cables are coming down from the front from the steering of the where they attach to the engine if you just if you just they show doing it with a turnbuckle uh, the most common way was actually with some with springs to maintain tension. But if you just attach the cables directly to the, I'm going to say outboard, um, you'll get a fairly quick steering ratio. In other words, maybe one, you know, one turn or one and a half turns lock to lock. Uh, but it, like I've done in mine, if you want to make it a lot more comfortable for cruising, if you're not looking for high performance, if you put a pull, put two pulleys on the engine, loop the cable back through, and then attach it to the trip to the hull again. Basically, you're adding an extra pulley in the, on each end. It cuts the steering ratio in half, so now you have th like three turns, yeah. lock to lock, which makes it much easier to steer and a lot less quirky to drive. Um, which you're not going to hear anything about that has nothing to do with the test. That's just my own experience. Just, again, I like that because it's simple, you have the ability to do, you know, to play with it and do things. The, you know, the enclosed push-pull cable system, you get what you get. Russell, so I didn't know 65 Starcraft that was the drum and cable. Yeah. Said, right, but we converted it to Teleflex. So it's Teleflex that cable drum. Yeah. It's now one that comes up and it's all. Yeah, it's pro Teleflex does both a rack and pinion or a drum type. It could be either. Teleflex is just a brand. Yeah, yeah so it's basically it's a single cable yeah. now that just comes up and it's yeah. all. Yeah, it depends. If you've got a big round thing that's that's the uh, rotary type and if you've got a long you know if you've got a like a stick Saturday, underneath yeah. it that's the rack um, and don't get me wrong those are they're good reliable systems um, they're probably a lot easier from a manufacturer to install in a new boat mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> And it, but it is just something to be aware of that they do corrode internally. And I had, I had a one. It was actually a boat that my dad had when I was a kid that had the Teleflex uh, rotary system, and it sat for years and years. And I decided to rebuild it. It probably hadn't been run in ten years. Of course, the cable, the steering was bound right up. It wouldn't steer at all. And I figured out the cable was what was it had just the cable had stuck inside, um, and so me being well partially cheap and partially just to see if I could do it, I actually took a piece of hose, uh, disconnected the cable from the engine end, slid the hose over it and clamped it to the outer casing. I filled it with motor oil and then I hose clamped an air fitting so I could click an airline onto it. And I let it. I left it like that overnight, and I basically it forced the oil to creep into the cable, and it worked. I could free it up. And again, it's not something I necessarily recommend from a safety standpoint. But this was many years ago, and um, it was half me being too lazy to replace the whole thing, and half not wanting to spend the money to do it. <clears throat> um. And all right, 
and you'll see on, on page 116 there's several different um, several different diagrams they all they are all yeah they're all pretty much pull pull systems um, you know there is in the um, in the sailboat pedestal steering the cave that pull pull cable is actually attached to a chain that and when they say chain like a bicycle chain type thing that goes around a gear on the um, they go on the steering shaft on the pedestal but the ends that they don't really show it there clearly but the ends of those chains are just attached to the cable so it's it's kind of the same idea as just having it wrapped around but by doing it like that with a chain they can make it a much smaller assembly uh, the only the issue with pedestal steering is there's maintenance involved you got to make sure that chain stays lubricated or more more maintenance So basically, the way to remember the uh, in mo in the push pull systems, um, you know the rudder is moved by a single cable actuated by the steering wheel, whereas a pull pull system is normally two cables pulling in each direction. I know you get all have questions because it's a little it's because um, I'm kind of referring to me drum and drum and cable is to in as far as I'm concerned is a pole pole system and I notice in here um, paragraph 32 they say the pole pole system is an alternative to the drum and cable um, other than and I think they're referring in this case more to like the sailboat system where it's a gear and a chain, not a drum. But the drum and cable essentially is a pull pull system. And when they the reason they they call it pull pull because when you steer to the port side, you're pulling on the cable on the starboard side of the tiller. And when you go to the starboard side, you're pulling on the port cable. So basically, no matter which, you're pulling on a cable whichever way you go. Whereas a push pull is when you're turning starboard, you're pushing the cable, you know, you're pushing the tiller to the port side. And when you're going port, you're pulling the back to the starboard side. So that's where those terms come push pull versus pull pull. sleeve that keeps it from like buckling yes so the push is not a buckle but a yeah extra and also buckle. it's a fairly rigid cable right. that's the other one of the other advantages in my opinion to the old school uh, drum and cable is you're only dealing with a quarter inch or five sixteenths diameter cable you can run that around a pulley that has a circumference that big around whereas the push pull cable is a big diameter cable and you can't bend that more than you know maybe a, off the top of my head you know a 12 inch diameter bend so you you know you can't tuck it into the corners the way you can with the old you know again my the old uh, MFG boat that little 14 foot MFG boat we've got 
the entire searing system is tucked up under the gunnels. You don't see any of it because it's the it's the it's the pull pull mm -hmm. cable system. So I can literally hide everything up there, and the cables go literally right to the corners of the of the vessel. Whereas if I use the pull the push pull cable, it would have to come. I'd have to cut the corner in the back. But the the fuel stop is a push pull cable, essentially, right? The fuel stop. The fuel. The throttle fuel cable. cable. Yeah, that'd be a push pull. Yeah, those are generally a push pull. Right. And again, it's the same idea. It's a, but those are usually a solid. That's not a braided. That's usually a solid steel cable in a casing. And those work exactly the same way. The outer casing is fastened to the control and fastened to the engine, and the inner part goes to your actual throttle linkage. And again, but it's the same thing because of the it's an inner and outer cable. You have that same scenario. The cable you can't put them around a little. You can't crunch them into a corner. Um, with any cables, you basically want to try to keep the bends as um, mild as possible. Um. All right, and then uh, pedestal steering. Well, they say at least once a year you should inspect your steering system. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you should be looking, you should be inspecting a searing system once a year, regardless of what kind it is. Um, you know, greasing pivot points, looking for corrosion, no matter what it is. Um, again, for the purposes of this course, you're going to use Teflon grease on the pedestal shaft bearings. You may want to remember that. Can you, is there a figure that shows what the pedestal shaft bearings are? I believe. I believe the <coughs> uh, <clears throat> basically, I didn't. If you, if you look at. 84. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you look at. They don't label as such. If you look at page 80. Uh, look at. Uh, Figure 84, okay. the upper right corner where the steering pedestal is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, at the top of that, behind that, you see where the chain is. Yeah. Basically, the pedestal shaft bearings are the bearings that support that shaft that the steering wheel is on and that the chain goes around. So it's the horizontal. So basically, you know, the bearings are going to be. You can almost see a round, like a little round disc just in mm -hmm. front of the chain. Okay. That's, there's gonna be two bearings there to support that shaft. And th that would be your pedestal shaft bearings. Yeah, I had, I had one a pedestal on my silver. Just remove, remove your, uh, your pinnacle compass. And down below you'll see the bearings, there's a hole actually, it looks like it's really hole right at the top of the bearing. And that's where you put the grease. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that some of the older stuff used to have a uh, oil cup that you actually put right. a few drops of oil in it. And also, if you look at in uh, 81, at the bottom of the pedestal, you see these like two barrels or two uh, turning blocks. Yeah. And also out beside the uh, quadrant, there's turning blocks there. They have a drop of oil on each one of those. Like okay. Of the here. <clears throat> the Teflon grease will work just as well. The only problem with Teflon grease is it doesn't flow well. Yeah. You know, part of the point is it's again, just on the top of the pin. Again, if you know, if you've got so, if you've got a boat that's new enough that you've got paperwork with an owner's manual, yeah. is you know will give you what needs to be lubed and when. I mean, if you've got like these guys have got an older boat that mm -hmm. probably don't have manuals to specify all that. You kind of just go through anything that moves or you know it just it's common sense if you've got pulleys you want to put a drop of oil with a pivot um, you know any way any parts that are going to wear need to be lubricated periodically 
The next one is the next thing they talk about is worm gear steering. The main thing you need to know about worm gear steering is it is non reversing. And basically, what that means is most of these steering systems, if you grab the rudder and put a little bit of muscle to it, you'll spin the steering wheel. Worm gear steering is being non-reversing you're not moving pressure on the rudder is not is, is not as likely to turn the steering wheel um, it has to do with the mechanical um, are you damaged if I go on that no you just you won't be able to do it good that's more it, it won't move it won't move it's more I'm assuming, and again, I, I could be wrong, but I'm assuming that's more geared again towards sailboats where you want it to stay where you left, you know, you want to sit, you set your rudder position, you want it to stay there while you trim a sail or do whatever. Um, and so that's the main thing that it's pretty much the steering going to stay where you put it. Um, if you ever go on an older sailboat that has a stern hung rudder, you'll see that the the steering wheel is like backwards. Yeah. Have you ever seen those? They look like they're sitting on the on the lazarette on the back of the boat. On the yawls and catboats. Cat boats. Yeah, the yawls and catboats and uh, all those. Those are usually uh, worm gear. It's they, the pintle is basically the, the pintle, not the pintle, the uh, pinion gear is on the top of the rudder. Yeah, it's that's similar. Post. Yeah. It's similar to what automotive, you know, a well, at this point, antique automotive, but it's the way autom automobiles used to be. Right. That, and again, in an automobile, it was they wanted that feature so that you don't feel every you know every bump and every stone on the road is not trying to rip the steering wheel out of your hand. Again, is just you want to remember that non-reversing feature. Um, yeah. So again. then that means, sorry. So that it that it won't that it won't Basically, self-correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you take your hand off the wheel, it won't yeah. it, it won't yeah, center it itself. It won't try to go back. Right. The waterfall yeah. wants to push it straight. Yeah. Right. So it, um, but the main thing it's it's, it's kind of it's one, it's a one way thing. You can yeah. you can turn you can turn the rudder with the steering wheel, but you can't really turn the steering wheel by the pulling the rudder. Okay. Whereas on a push pull cable or a drumming cable or a rotary system, you could grab the rudder and you know you could muscle the rudder over and spin the steering wheel. You know, as far as maintenance, um, worm gear steering does, uh, you know, again, like anything else, you've got metal to metal contact where the worm gear and the sector shaft are inter, you know, where they ride against you, that needs to be lubricated. We have rod and lever steering, which they show on figure 88, that's similar to what we talked about with the uh, throttle controls. It's a very basic. Um, and then the other the other uh, modern common 
system in larger vessels is hydraulic. Um, and <clears throat> Um, the one of the big advantages to hydraulic steering is it's very easy to have multiple stations. Um, they generally hydraulic steering will generally have check valves in them so that they don't feed back through the other stations. So you can have two, three steering stations. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the other, another big advantage to hydraulic steering is unlike cables. You know, you can tuck you can tuck the lines pretty much anywhere. You can make tight bends with them. Um, you know, it's uh, again hydraulics tend to be it's a lot more expensive because now you've got each helm is essentially a hydraulic pump, mm -hmm. and at the rudder you have a hydraulic slave cylinder. So you can almost think of hydraulic steering as the principle is pretty much the same as a push-pull cable, but instead of using a steel cable, you're using a flu you're using a column of fluid. Um, you're pushing and pulling by if uh, you know if you take a piece of pipe and Basically, say you put a rubber plunger, you fill that pipe absolutely full of fluid with no, no air in it. And if you take a plunger and push that plunger, say the pipe's an inch in diameter, you push that plunger in 10 inches, that pipe can be 10 feet long or theoretically 1,000 feet long. And if it's the same one inch at the other end, you're going to get that exact same 10 inches of movement. The downside to hydraulics is you, is you have to have an absolute, uh, absolute no, absolutely no air in the system, because air will compress, so you'll lose some of that action. Mm -hmm. um, that's often with hydraulic steering. How you know you've got if you've got an issue, you you start feel the feel the steering wheel just feels kind of mushy. It's kind of if anybody's ever had a brake line go on a car, you know the brake pedal gets soft. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, generally, the on hydraulic steering, they will pressurize the fluid reservoir. Um, to they pressurize it about thirty psi, and the purpose of that is by pressurizing the system, because like the. Again, like the push-pull cable, when you're turning, say you're turn, say you turn to starboard, it's pressurizing the hydraulic cylinder to move the the uh, rudder. When you're turning to port, you're actually uh, pulling or putting a vacuum on that to pull the cable, the rudder back, and. Um, so, unfortunately, there's a natural tendency there, if you're pulling below atmospheric pressure, that you're going to have, you're going to want, the air is going to want to come in around the seals. It's kind of the same principle I talked about with taking a, when we, I think I had talked about, well, I don't think it was part of the course, but I mentioned as we were talking about boat trailer bearings, you were asking about greasing them, and it's the same principle that I always pump grease into my bearing bodies so that the bearing the grease is under pressure so that when you dunk it in the cold water you don't get a vacuum that pulls in the seawater. Uh, hydraulic steering is kind of the same idea as why they pressurize it uh, and also the seals in the system are designed to seal under they seal better under pressure so what they do is pressurize the entire system to alleviate air getting pulled into it. So in the case of that diagram in figure 91, why is it that there's three hydraulic lines coming from each of the stations? 
and going into the reservoir if what you were saying is essentially it acts like a push pull except you have fluid instead of a cable why would you need three lines then Three stations. Well, no, he's talking about the, the three lines. Um, yeah. The one is a supply line. Well, in this particular case, this is actually acting. This this particular diagram is acting as a more like a. Well, I can't say a pull pull anymore. It's a push push. You know. Right. You're pushing both ways. This is. Um, um, this particular system, you can think of it more like the uh, drum and cable steering, where you've got a pressure line and a return line. Yeah. So, so one line. So one line, you're you're pushing, so, and it'll push yeah, the. When you're turning to, like you're turning to. It'll push the, the steering cylinder one way. The other one pushes it the other way. Yeah. And then what's the the, the purpose of the third line? Um, generally, the third. It's the the third line, line is a that's the supply line from, is a, from the reservoir. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the yellow line. It okay. goes up to the steering stations and then from there it's pumped out either to the green line or the red line, depending upon which direction you want to go. Um, I believe it's a little confusing because I have questions myself, but I suspect and I'm not this is my own opinion. I believe that line coming from the third line coming from the steering cylinder back to the reservoir, I suspect is a bleed line to allow um, allow any trapped air to get out of the system. If, I mean, if you just have an incoming line, an outgoing line, mm -hmm. if you've got a bubble of air in this cylinder, you're not going to be able to get rid of it. All you're going to do is move the bubble around. Okay. I suspect that that does two things. One, it allows the air to work its way back to the reservoir. And also, um, in order, if you pressurize the system, the whole, the whole system has to be pressurized equally. Otherwise, it's going to want to go one way. And I think that's why this pressurized reservoir goes both to the steering helms and to the cylinder. Okay. Uh, it's a little vague, you know, I'm being a little vague because I'll be honest, I don't exactly know the answer to your question. So okay. Okay. this is my assumption yeah. of how that. No, that makes sense. It keeps so. it as a closed loop system yeah. so that there's fluid in all directions. So Right, so it comes in through the yellow and then goes yeah. out through yeah. either red or green depending upon right. which way you're turning. Right. Okay. From the steering station. But when right. it gets back to the to the uh, the steering cylinder, it, the overflow of that goes into the what's called here the relief valve. But the relief valve is really an air valve that allows it to, the air to go out. But the inverse of that is I I have to pump mine up, and there's another valve on the top of the reservoir, and I have to pump mine up, put pressure on that, and that keeps pressure on the top of the fluid, so it it pretty much keeps that pressure constant across all of the uh, hydraulic devices. Oh. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, you wouldn't need to pressurize the system. If, if there was no, absolutely no air leak, you know, no seepage of seals, or, but unfortunately, in the real world, it, you always yeah. get some sort of seepage, and right. if, you, if fluid seeps out, something's gonna replace it, which is gonna be air. So the way they the way they do that is to pressurize the system, and the other thing it also enables the seals are made so that the pressure actually puts more pressure to seal the it the seals are designed so the pressure is actually helping them seal. Right. You know, again, for purposes of the exam, you just understand that what hydraulic steering is and that the fluid reservoir is pressurized to about 30 PSI. I do know on my, on my system, depending upon how hot the, the week has been, the pressure will go up and down. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's okay. also part of the reason that you bring that up for doing the air pressure. Is it, it, the air pressure acts like an accumulator, 
Because yeah, as temperature mm -hmm. fluctuates, fluid's going to expand and contract. Yeah, I usually and check mine about once a month. The air allows it to do that. Underneath my berth, uh, main cabin, it just <coughs> ain't an act like that. <laughs> Yeah, so you, are, you actually have hydraulic steering. Yeah. yeah. Two stations, yeah. Hmm. I think you're one of the first first people I've had in the class that's actually <laughs> had that. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I've had it mine's different than yours, though. Yeah. I, I actually lost my steering at the engine once. And I had to, re but then had to create a bypass. Oh, and right. then without, because I don't think I have the reservoir, I had to go through the helm and that's it with the funnel. Oh, really? Add it and then spin. So once you've disconnected, I could spin. Yeah. It, it takes out the locks. Yeah. You can just spin, 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 and you'll watch the air come up. And then you go the other way, watch right. the air come up, and eventually you'll bleed the system out. And yeah, then recalculate. And then, yeah. Because my, my reservoir, as I said, it's under the berth in, in the main cabin floor, yeah. actually in the aft cabin. So it's really low, almost at the, uh, almost at the rudder. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a second helm way up above. Do you have a screw on the top of your helm or no? So I've got a screw on top of my helm that oh, I can no, bleed no, out. No. Uh, why don't we hit let's yeah. run through the chapter nine homework and if you you know if for any of you that haven't done it if you take a stab at it if you really stumbled then you can pass but <laughs> okay all boats are steered by deflecting the flow of In a stir mounted run, uh, rudder and tiller system, the uh, the gudgeon is a D socket that a pencil fits into D. Steering gear stuffing boxes B require frequent inspection to check for leakage. Four. What is an important safety step to take? with a tiller-mounted router on a small sailboat. Install a collar pin in the pencil to prevent the rudder from floating out of the gudgeon, D? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the two basic self-enclosed mechanical steering systems in use today are B, rack and pinion, and rotary. Push-pull cable steering system. The rudder is moved by a Roman cable. Yeah. Seventy. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Right. We read that in a push-pull. Yeah. Not a pull-pull. So it's so rack and pinion would be TC. Rack and pinion that would be. I thought you were right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was confused on that one at first. I had B because. The rack and pinion doesn't actually move the rudder. You, you've got the rack and pinion, then you've got the cable, and then you've got the quadrant. So I mean, it, it, I read that too specifically, yeah. I guess. Yeah, but that's one of those that doesn't, nothing else really works. Because it says specifically yeah. in a push-pull cable steering system, so it's not a tiller and rod, a tiller or rod, because it's a cable system. Right, right. So A is the right answer? Uh, C. C is the C. correct answer. And in a lot of these questions, these questions are, are a literal sentence in one of these Yeah, papers. that one oh, yeah. is. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I actually read that sentence <laughs> early, a few minutes ago. Yeah. Um, Seven. The advantage of the no feedback steering system is A, it isolates the engine's torque from the driver. Yep. Eight, pedestal steering maintenance includes Teflon grease on the pedestal shaft bearing seat. At least somebody was listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most important feature of worm gear steering? C, non reversing action. Ten. In a hydraulic steering system, a fluid reservoir is pressurized to about 30 psi to 200 kPa. C. Yeah. Hydraulic steering A eliminates kickback from the rudder. All right. You must have actually read it. Yeah. 
Because I didn't say anything about that one. <laughs> Yeah, that's so this. That's this week's. Um, I have a question on that one, Rusty. Uh, C says eliminates the need for fixed stops. Uh, Most what? hydraulic systems. I mean, uh, that's on number eleven. Hydraulic steering. Yeah. Most hydraulic systems don't have fixed stops on the rudder. Yeah. So it also does that. Yeah, again, it, it's, uh, but it, the particular design of the system may eliminate that need, but the fact it's hydraulic doesn't. Okay. You know, because if, you know, theoretically, you could just keep going with the, until you damage the piston. Right. Until um, it gets to the maximum. You know, if the normally, but I would agree with you, normally hydraulic pistons are designed so that they hit, when they hit a stop, they won't destroy themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, on that though, so I have an outboard with hydraulic, so mine, because the outboard, it fixes, it's, it's on a sense, of, I guess yeah. it depends on whether or not you have a rudder versus an outboard, so mm -hmm. it's hydraulic, I'm fixed. Yeah. Again, as far as the stuff. correct answer to the test, that's, you could, it's what the text says. Right. Yeah. Yeah, put a question mark for the seat. Would you ever have a boat that had electric cylinders instead of hydraulic? I mean, you could basically drive by wire. Shh, don't give them any ideas. Okay. <laughs> um, if, if you consider the combination of electricity and salt water with a primary control like steering, I don't even want to think about it. It makes my brain hurt. <laughs> I guarantee someone has come up with it. It just seems like it would be simpler. It's probably, than, than and honestly, hydraulic. Yeah. if it isn't already out there, I suspect it will be because automobiles are going to that. You know, electric power steering has become probably more common than not on, brand, on the brand new vehicles. I would rather Tesla build a boat and self docking. <laughs> But they, I mean, obviously there are, you know, these bigger, these, these larger boats have wireless joystick controls anyway. Right. But they're just actuating motors to do it. Yeah, it's still a, it's still a, um, a hydraulic. But, you know, it's funny you mentioned that, but I, I, it, I suspect that's probably coming down, going to be something we will see at some point. Yeah. I'm not aware of anybody doing it yet. The problem is the reason, what bothers me is the reason that they will do it. And the reason they will do it is because it will be cheaper to produce than a hydraulic or a, and you know, it's easy to run, it's easy to run wires compared to cables or hydraulic lines. Unfortunately, it's much harder to fix when it malfunctions. Right, um, so we have no questions on the steering at this point. We'll, we'll start on emergency just on the last this next week we're basically going to do the homework and then jump into review for the exam um, um, I suppose the first thing that's going to come up Um, first thing I'm going to discuss is a tool toolkit. Or they're calling it a basic get home toolkit. Honestly, a toolkit 
on all of your boats is probably going to vary depending on your mechanical ability and skill level. And, you know, there's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense to carry tools for advanced engine repair if you're never going to tear into it. But on the other hand, you know, even everybody should have a basic toolkit on board because even if the captain or the boat owner doesn't know how to deal with something. There may be somebody with you or where you are that does. Um, and there are a few things that, I mean, you can read the list of what they're suggesting. A uh, couple of things that may or may not be on their list. I haven't looked at it in a while. That, our tops on my list is a roll of duct tape, Gorilla Tape, um, Flex Seal Tape is actually, um, you know, I would have a roll of duct tape, but also a roll of that, gorilla, that Flex Seal Tape, that stuff is actually pretty amazing. That can really bail you out. Um, what's, what's unhappy? Together. <laughs> well, you swing the door, the door and you can use it as a bottom <laughs> yeah. of the boat. If, if, you, get, um, if you get hold, it will, it will seal the hole underwater. You can make yeah, a that's yeah. the beauty. Use that flex seal things. stuff, you can you can use it underwater. Yeah. Um, okay. But more more importantly, you know, but not importantly, I shouldn't say more importantly, but more likely is, you know, you blow a hose in your cooling system. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that it can be the difference between being towed and getting home under power. Yeah. Um, the other thing I strongly suggest is a couple of different sizes, basically a small assortment of nylon wire ties, or zip ties as we call them. <clears throat> that's another, you can do an infinite number of things with wire ties. Everything from fixing broken throttle linkage and You know, I used to do it years ago, I used to do a lot of uh, off-road motorcycle, um, like endurance riding, not speed, but just we'd be gone for a day, miles into the woods, and I keep, used to keep, and it was, you know, it was, you know, we were moving along, it was, uh, it was like hair scrambles and stuff, where we were timed, so you didn't want to carry a lot of weight, but I always carry, I, just a zip tied to my handlebars, a mini pair of vice grips, um, a half a dozen zip ties, and I would actually use a good quality electrical tape to hold all this stuff on the handlebars and a spare spark plug. And that pretty much that was what I carried for tools. And that got me home on more than one occasion when something broke. Yeah. Under the toolkit, what's the mechanics wire? It's a uh, small roll of mechanics wire. Yes, mechanics wire is, it's like very fine coat hanger, if you want to call it that. It's yeah. maybe a, I don't know, 30 second inch diameter. It's similar to binding, like if you have a, um, a notebook, like a, you know, a kid, like a kid would have in high school, the, the spiral bound notebook. Yeah. It's that about that size, but it's a more flexible wire. And again, it's you use it similar to like the, the wire ties. Okay. You you can use it to stitch things together, you can use it to I mean literally you can use it to hang your laundry when you forget when you don't have anything with you, you can make hooks with it. Okay. You get twenty five feet for ninety nine cents a hundred. <laughs> yeah, it's cheap. I mean, you can also no fish things out of the, break. when you drop something, you, you drop well, a nut or you drop something in the bill, you bilge. can make a hook on the end. And okay. Is that the stuff that they use on? It's like bailing wire, right? On high performance engines when they sometimes wire the fasteners? That's safety wire. Safety it's wire. similar. Safety S wire similar is, to that. Okay. Okay. safety wire is a little different alloy, right. but. You want Monell on the boat, you don't want to just the scale. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, okay, but it's just to, if you basically have to MacGyver it, something. To, yeah, to get, exactly. Yeah, to get back to the dock. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I mean, there have been times where, 
safety wire and duct tape, I've been able to build a piece to replace something that broke, you know. I had, uh, it's funny you talk about, you know, I talk about duct tape, but I literally had years ago, I was a scoutmaster, this was many years ago, we were doing a canoe trip, and I had, I think we had about 60 uh, kids with their dads. It was a father and son canoe trip we used to do every year. We'd start in Millis and go down the Charles River, camp overnight, and then end up in Needham the next day. We were on our way out to Millis. I had the, the council, Boston Council, had a huge trailer. I think it was eight, eight canoes on it. You know, they're all flipped. They were all racks. The trailer had like tees, and we were going out through through Millis, on the or you know through Millis or Medway, not Medway, um, Medfield, I guess it was. And we came across an open stretch of the road. A gust of wind caught it and actually broke the rings that one of the canoes was tied. The rings that were welded to the trailer broke. The trail that the uh, canoe flips up and goes head on into a pickup truck coming the other way wow. at, I don't know, probably 30 miles an hour. I mean, bad enough that the truck had to be towed because it took a, it caught the front, took out the grill and the radiator, the you know, a point of the canoe went into the truck. And, you know, so we stopped and changed papers and all, all that. And it was like, okay, now I'm looking at the canoe and it had buckled the, with a front with the aluminum it was an old Grumman aluminum canoe I got out the duct tape and we taped it all up and I actually took that canoe myself just because I didn't want anybody sinking and it got through the whole weekend no problem and I had to laugh you know the truck the truck it hit got towed away and the canoe was still worked trying keeps <laughs> going but no, I believe that was fun trying to fill out the insurance forms on that one uh, Lucky the other guy didn't get hurt. Yeah. No, it didn't go up over. It just it hit him. Unfortunately, the poor guy, they had just gotten the truck back from the body shop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, uh, back to where we were at. The... Um, the other thing that I suggest I've done all my boats is any particularly through hull fittings um, but really any uh, hose anything that hose clamps on on my boat I have always doubled up I'll take if you know if the like the exhaust man the exhaust rise have big hose big hoses on the man on the elbows mm -hmm. and they're held on with big hose clamps I've been, I'll put a second hose clamp right next to the first one. Not so much because the, uh, you know, to stop leaks and stuff. It's if that hose clamp fails or um, particularly through hull fittings, I'll put the, I'll put a second hose clamp, like for my head, the water intake, um, I'll put a second hose clamp on the hose further up. I don't really crank down on it. I just put it on there enough to stay. And that way, if something happens, you know, if you have a hose failure, normally if you have a hose failure, it's going to be where the clamps are. Um, you can literally, you know, cut that piece off, stuff the hose back on, and slide the clamp down and tighten it up. Um, you know, I don't know if they mentioned hose clamps in here, but that's... Yes. Yeah, they do. They teach stainless steel hose clamps. Yeah. Um, I thought there's a code on that that any any hoses that are below the water line yeah, they are require, supposed to be double clamped. Have to be do they yeah. To be double, yeah. And but I'm saying that they are double clamped. But I tend to put another clamp on the hose above it. And oftentimes, in fact, I've yet to have to use one because I had a failure there. But there've been a number of times where I've ended up grabbing that extra clamp for something else. Okay. And also, I mean, it may sound crazy, but I also, that means I know where the clamps are when I need them. Yeah. You know, they're not stuffed down in the build somewhere. Yeah. Um, I need a bigger 
fuel block. Hmm? I got a fuel block. Go, somewhere. go through that list. And, like, and, and, and it, again, what, what you want to carry for tools it. also varies on what is serviceable yeah. on the, you know, out in the water on your particular boat. Um, you know, when I had, when I used to take the kids, we used to cruise with my, the Bayliner I had, um, I actually carried an entire ignition system because on that, I had the, I had points, I had condenser, I had ignition coil, um, I had all that stuff. I used, cause th that stuff's all fairly small. I just kept a box, a, a basically parts box. It was a tackle box because that was all stuff that I could change out on the water. Yeah. And because I had it all with me, I never needed to. Yeah. Right. But I also was more concerned because mine was a single engine. So if I was, and you know, we used to go from like um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to the vineyard. We were, could be anywhere in there, so we could be a fair yeah. distance away. Yeah, that's the other thing I was thinking. If we have a electrical or cooling issue on one motor, I'm just gonna. To shut that motor yeah. off and just yeah, and you can the motor back on the other one and then fix it at the dock. So. Um, <clears throat> uh, the other thing, if you're in salt water, you want to any of your metal tools, wrenches, pliers, that stuff. You want to give them a code of WD-40 or something because they do rust. I mean, even in the boat where it's dry. Mm -hmm. You know, unless again, I mean, if you have air conditioning all the time, but even then, I still would do it because the pliers aren't going to help you when you haven't used them in four years and you go to pull them out of the box and they're a big ball of rust. Yeah. Rusty, I've got to go and pick up my wife, so she's all right. in with the cord. All right. You're all in. Yeah. I'm trying to remember to save those little, little silver packets. Oh, yeah. That come with like electronics and stuff, you throw those in the toolbox. You want me to start collecting them? That's what I've got in my tool. I have plastic toolbox. Yeah. 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 Hmm? And uh, I put a piece of no. Paper. It's it's well, yeah. I cut it's a piece of towel. Seven, it's got the diesel at the front of our car, so it's a great piece of paper. And then I put all my tools in there. And then I get a mist. But then my car also went in. So I broke it down and loaded it by down. I do that once a year. I got to check engine light, so we'll start replacing it. We're in our toolbox. All the time, so it's, it's, they're, they're getting <laughs> used. <laughs> Another thing that you're probably going to want is a small a 12 volt test light. Yeah, uh, um, that, that's something I use all the time. So I say, and oftentimes, you can, you know, you get, especially if you have electrical issues. You know, oftentimes it's a matter of it's usually a, it, especially in the boat, it's usually a delayed connection. Oftentimes it's bad. It's as simple as a battery terminal that looks good, but doesn't uh, isn't making contact. And you can pick right up on that with a test light. You can narrow down all of the circuit. Yeah, you know, you lose. Like, oh, I need it, and they don't have it. Exactly. Right. You, you start. You lose. Say you lose your instruments. Mm -hmm. um, you enter them with the test light, and you, know, you ground the. And most boats will have a, a ground somewhere around the helm. Yeah. Um, and then you can go first. Go right to your go right to your fuse or breaker panel. <coughs> do we have power at the panel? And now you've you've cut now you've cut your possibilities in half, because if you don't have power, then you go okay. We got to go back and look at the the major wiring, starting with battery terminals, battery cutoff switch. <coughs> if you do have power there, then you say okay. Now we got to start looking up toward the. And the other quick, it's also if you have a boat that has fuses, it's a quick way to check <coughs> fuses because a lot of times you really can't see if they're blown. But if you just go on the on the load side of the fuse, the fuse the side that goes to whatever, yeah, <coughs> and you can go right across real quick and light, 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 no light. Oh, that one's blowing. Yeah. <coughs> yeah.
Um, depending on accessibility and if it's safe to do so is carrying spare fuel filters. Um, and I say that because obviously, you know, messing around with fuel in the bilge of a boat can be dangerous. So this is something you have to, you know, it depends on the design of the boat if you can safely change a filter. Because that's, that's something you see fairly often that, uh, you know, you get caught in some rough weather and all of a sudden you end up with it sputtering and running issues because you're mixing up all of the, the water and dirt in the bottom of the tank that has just been sitting there for years. Because most fuel tanks don't take, the fuel does not get taken from the, because they use a dip tube that it, it doesn't go all the way to the bottom of the tank. They usually leave an inch or so, so that you're not picking up all the debris in the bottom of the tank. But again, you get caught in rough weather and you start thrashing around, all of a sudden that all mixes up and you're pulling in. And you know, if, you're, if your fuel filters are acceptable, are accessible, you know, that again could be the difference between getting towed and And again, you know, if you have an older boat and you have room, you may want to consider relocating fuel filters so they are accessible, especially in a, especially if you have a diesel. If you've got a diesel engine, you definitely should consider, you know, consider where your filters are and make sure you carry carry spares because diesel is a lot is no as near as dangerous as far as fumes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For having a box of like spare parts, like you said, is there any issue with keeping that in the engine compartment so long as it's secured and isn't going to interfere with anything um, else? Not really. Okay. Um, other than you may want to think about if you've got rubber parts that are going to dry out from the heat. Okay. But again, you know, carrying spare parts is going to again be kind of dictated by your particular vessel and what can you change I mean it doesn't like yeah. if you've got a you know if you've got a Mercruiser or Alpha stern drive it doesn't make much sense to carry a spare water pump because you're not going to do that in the water right but if you've got an in like your your yeah. raw water pumps may be something you can do yeah you know if you've got a set if you've got a straight inboard with a raw water pump that's belt driven off the engine yeah. and you've got a seacock you can close so you can take that water pump you can change that impeller and you know I say it like it's easy it, does, it may not be oh, easy yeah. to do but it, <laughs> they're not easy to get to <laughs> you know it still may be versus having to wait to get towed <clears throat> yeah okay. um, you know, again, being twin engine, hopefully you're not going to have both fail at once. But, you know, again, stranger things have happened. You have a light grounding or something and you pull up, you know, you, you suck a bunch of debris in there. It's not out of the question. You can follow two pumps. Yeah. Um, what do you look for me for? We would never do that. What about <laughs> <laughs> We would never do that again. <laughs> yes, we won't. Never do not with the again, new again. But uh, what uh, do you suggest that we have your number? Uh, <laughs> Speed dial. Yeah. yeah, well, you'll get the same response my wife got. <laughs> it goes. Yeah. So I heard you say, is this an emergency? And we'll go, yes! Yeah, yeah. I'll call you it's, back. It's 911, CTO, Rusty. <laughs> Just a thought.
much time here goes to this. When you list the things, when you're saying flux seal tape, um, if, what's the difference between duct tape, gorilla tape, oh, flex seal tape, I know what that is, yeah. but. Yeah, duct tape and gorilla tape, I mean, they're the same, just branding, you know, it's, but flex seal is actually a, that's, that's a different product. Okay, gorilla tape does some stuff like that. I've tried using it in our. I found gorilla it's tape not is. Good. It's it's better at some things than duct tape, not as good as at others. Yeah. Um, they claim that it like, flex seal tape. The only downside to flex seal tape is good luck getting it off later. Um, yeah. I mean, it is impossible. Um, <laughs> it's a new part of the book. Paint it over. But uh, yeah, I had uh, I actually had I've got an old aluminum boat that. Had forever, and it was you know, the rivets were all popping. I mean, it's I'm guessing it's about a 1960 vintage, 59, 60. As a kid, I found it sunk in the river. <laughs> a buddy of mine pulled it out, and we went down. It was, in, it was down in Hummer Rock. We went down to the Situate Police Station and reported it, and we had to wait a year, and nobody claimed it, and so it became my prize. I mean, it leaked like a sieve, and it was a, it was a learning. I mean, I was probably ten years old, eleven years yeah, old. I was young. Back then. Did they have flex seal back then? No, mm -hmm. but I at the time I was like, oh, I'm gonna fix this thing up, you know. And so that's because first thing I went down to the hardware store and bought pop rivets. I knew nothing about them. I didn't know they have holes in them. So, the, <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't. I, well, I didn't. I shouldn't say I didn't buy them. I went down there to buy them. And I was like, okay, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> and so then my dad, with my dad's suggestion, we bought, uh, I bought stainless steel nuts and bolts. And my buddy and I basically replaced all the pop rivets with little tiny nuts and bolts. Oh. Um, it probably cost my dad a fortune in hardware. <laughs> Kept uh, your yeah, <laughs> well, I did, and I used that boat as a kid for years up and down the river. And, and literally, I still have it. And it, you know, it popped more rivets because they just they get old. And um, when I was looking at it a couple of years ago, I was like, you know, this was sitting out next to the car. I was like, you know, I either going to get rid of this, either going to scrap this thing or fix it. And of course, me being me, I thought, well, I can't scrap it. So my first thought was, you know, I bet I could just buy a couple of rolls of flex steel tape and run right down where the rivets were. Yeah. <laughs> Spray paint but the whole thing with that. I actually, yeah, I, ended up, I ended up buying another bag of stainless nuts and bolts because uh, the ones I had put in 40 years ago were still holding up. So. Good for another 15 years. Um, and uh, we still, I'm still using it. I'm still the one with the 1957 18 horse Johnson that I had on the back of it as a kid. Have you ever taken an inventory of how many internal combustion engines no. you have? <laughs> Too many. Because every week it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, cars, stuff trucks, just... lawnmowers, dirt bikes, well, snowmobiles, yeah. outboard is, motors. <laughs> this stuff just shows up. People are like, yeah, I want to get rid of this. Um, in fact, Jeff can, you've taken up a corner of my barn. <laughs> I have two or three outboards you dropped off when you need to get rid of them. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Joe Kelleher just gave you one recently, didn't he? Yeah, that actually ended up going to the scrapyard. Yeah, well, <laughs> you couldn't salvage it. No, it was too new. I had no interest in saving that. <laughs> that, was like, that was like 80s. It was going to cost more. Than, the, the electronic module was oh, bad in it. Yeah. I was like... You know, I'm not spending hundreds of dollars to Joe fix. Joe would not give anything away that he could fix. Yeah. <laughs> well, I figured I could fix it. That's one of the few things that there's really no way I can, you know, when the modules go bad, which is one of the reasons I like playing with the old stuff. You yeah. Know? If there's no spark, you run a file through the points, and you know, if you can't fix it with, like, rocks and hammers and things, then it's, it's too new for me. <laughs>
Next thing I'll talk a little bit about is, you know, if the if the engine if an engine just stops while you're underway. Um, obviously, as it said before, the first and foremost, don't panic. Call Westy. And you know, basically, make sure you're in a good situation, as good a situation you can, as far as make sure you're safe. If, I mean, if you're not in a safe area, if you're, um, you know, if you're in danger of getting washed, you know, washed onto the shore, onto the beach, or, you know, you're in a shipping lane, or you, you know, you got to evaluate that. If that's, if you're not in a safe situation, your first call should be CETO, come get me. Mm -hmm. And if it's a particularly, you know, if you're a shipping lane or something, I didn't, I would probably start by calling the Coast Guard or something, just let them know I'm out here. Or, yeah. um, but once you, aside from those basic things, you know, if you're in, you throw the hook out, it's a nice day, you're not that far out, before you call for help, then it's probably worth doing, you know, doing a little investigation yourself. Maybe, you know, maybe there's something you can do. Um, you know, and as I said before, the first first clue, one of your clues may be what was it doing just before it died. Mm -hmm. You know, was it losing power? Um, if, for instance, if it would run if it would run good at reduced throttle, it seemed fine. But when you tried to give it more, get up and go, it would start stumbling and. That's again. It's generally an indication you've got a fuel issue. You're starving for fuel, fuel filter, fuel pump, something like that. Um, you know, usually at that point, my suggestion is you back off on the throttle and try to make it whole. But then, if it dies completely, um, you know, you start that's, you start looking toward fuel issues again. It's an outboard. You know, make sure your tank vents are working. Uh, make sure you have fuel. You wouldn't be the first that's at my, again, it's, it's automotive, but at my shop, it, we have cars towed in that are out of fuel fairly, you know, on a fairly regular basis. I'd say a couple times a year. Mm. People, and sometimes it's, as we, and we've talked about the, what about the accuracy of gauges? You know, Automo automobile gauges aren't any different. Some of them are not, they're not that accurate. And I, you know, I've had people try to call and say, hey, you're out of gauge, you know, you, you're out of fuel. Well, oh, I can't be, <laughs> it, you can't be, I'm looking at the gauge. It's empty. No, it's, you know, it's a, it's a molecrum of an inch above the empty. So it actually isn't completely empty. Yeah. How do you uh, calibrate the fuel gauges? You, well, other than taking a black magic marker on the face of your gauge, uh, <laughs> there's really no provision to calibrate them. It is what it is. Um, I shouldn't say that. There are some, if you really want to, you know, if you're really critical, but there are some and you can pull the sender out of the tank and you can actually bend the arm to get a more accurate reading. But frankly, you're going to get Normally, my recommendation, you try to get it as accurate as you can when the tank is nearing empty. Because if you get it accurate, you get it accurate at one end of the, it, like when it's full, it's probably not going to be accurate when it's empty. It's, it's always a balancing thing because, you know, those sending units are made, they're not made by the company that makes the tank. They're bought by the company that makes the tank and they, they fit, you know, 42 different fuel tanks and they're not all exactly the same. And, uh, and even, you know, if you take a multimeter, if you go down to West Marine and buy five sending units and own them out, measure every one of them, you're going to find no two are exactly alike. Actually, if you go online, you can buy this tape. They have a, a tape that goes down the side of any length uh, of a tank. And the tape has a sender on it and it sends it to a gauge. That's pretty accurate. That's what yeah, I ever seen that. Yeah, really. Did you? Well, yeah. it's similar to the one that they have for propane tanks as well. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. similar. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's called, called, it's called, right? I yeah, just have to yeah. fill my tank once a year. It's got 400 gallons. <coughs> it's not, we're not even going to use that much. In mm -hmm. one season? I, I fill it about once a season. Yeah. We just fill ours whenever we pass a fuel dock. <laughs> <laughs> Goes by everything except a fuel dock, right? <laughs> Does your, you said you've got the Lehman, the Ford yeah. Lehman diesels. Yeah. Now, do you have a dual fuel fil fuel filter arrangement where you can bypass one to yes. run on the other? Yeah. So you can change filters while you're underway. Yes. Yeah, that's kind and of a nice setup to have. Uh, on my red car, but my fuel filter is right up by my injector pump, so I can't do that. Yeah. I don't have one fuel filter. But uh, yeah, I know there are there are systems where you have two filters and you can switch one to the other. I can I can do that on the right core, but then the the secondary is a secondary filter on the engine or the primary. That's the primary. That's the primary. Yeah, that that's uh, that, that's a screw on one that I have. Right. But usually the one you want to be able to swap out underway is the first one in line from right. the tank because right. yeah, that's, that's the one that's going to plug out. Yeah. yeah, that's what I have. Yeah. Gemini has probably the same setup. Um, but uh, so aside from that, so back to what I was saying before, though, you know, if you're everything's running fine, you're cruising along, and all of a sudden it just cuts out like someone shut the key off. That's to me indicating you've got an. That's more likely to be an electrical issue. Um, you know, and at that point, again, in it's all of these suggestions depend on the on the configuration of the boat that we're in. Yeah, you know, if you can get if you can pull again, you know, if it's a gas engine, if you can pull a spark plug wire off and um, you know stick the wire on a screwdriver and put it a little bit away from ground, crank it over, see if you have spark. You know, if you don't have spark. Then I then I would check again, get out the the test light and see if you have power getting to your ignition coil. <coughs> uh, if there's no power there, then you want then again you want to start looking at bulkhead connector, wiring connectors, stuff like that. You know, I'm not saying you're going to be able to fix it, but you might. Uh, and you, before you start the season, inspect those connections and all that. Uh, you, it's not a bad idea to inspect, and the problem is, I found they don't look bad when they. I've seen a number of those. I've I've seen several things happen. One, the, you know, they corrosion obviously, but that you can see. But I also found as they get older, the vibration will actually cause the wires to break internally. It's not the actual plug; it's the wiring, a you know, a half inch from the plug where it's supported firmly in the molded plug and then it transitions into the cable right there if the wires work hard. And again, this tends to happen on older boats that have seen a lot of years. Um, I know that my my Bayliner did, I had that problem with it where things started acting. It was erratic. The gauges were sometimes would be a little flaky and um, you know, then it got to a point one day it didn't start and I grabbed them, I wiggled the connectors and it started. So the next the next weekend I literally re I eliminated the connector. I cut both ends off and um, heat shrunk all the wire. I just heat shrunk all the wires and hardwired it. The only downside to doing that was if you have to pull the engine or anything like that, now it's not just a simple plug. You gotta unhook every wire from every sensor. But it, again, it was a choice of that or replacing the whole harness, which seemed like a whole lot more work. Okay. And the other other common issue is fuel is uh, cooling system problems. Um, there you're looking for again if you have a water outflow above the water line, 
you want to see if you're pumping water, like outboards, you can see it if you have the telltale water. Um, otherwise, if it's an inboard application, um, you know, aside from obviously looking at the gauge, if, you, if you've got a functioning gauge, um, the other thing you can check is the, when you open the engine compartment, the exhaust elbows. Uh, if they're if it's if everything's functioning properly, those exhaust elbows, they'll be hot to the touch. I mean, they're, they're not. They'll be uncomfortable to hold your hand. You won't be able to hold your hands on them. But on the other hand, if you put your hand on it, you know you're not going to immediately see your skin. You're going to be able to put your hand and say, "Oh, that's hot. I probably shouldn't do that." You know, without blisters and. If those things are radiating heat, like the engine block, um, that's a good indication that you're not getting water flow. And uh, you know, if it, everything has been fine and this all of a sudden happens, you start. By, you know, you, I will obviously start by if you have seat strainers, you want to check those right off the bat. Uh, coolant. Uh, you know the. Uh, water pumps, pump or pumps, and that's also something you want to find. You, you should look at, look at, look in your boat, look in the service manual, see if that impeller, that water pump impeller is something that you can do in the boat when you're out of <coughs> water. If you can, you should carry a spare. They're relatively cheap. Um, and in some cases, it's not a bad idea to pick up a spare anyway, because even if you have to, you know, you may find, you may find that your marina or some, or you got a mechanic, or a mechanic can, you know, we could do it tomorrow, but we don't have the part. Here you go. <laughs> you know, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I can the part in the tools. I hate people like you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would suggest getting genuine parts, getting, you know, Mercruiser or, you know, whatever your... Uh, and you'll find marine mechanics, you know, if you, hand, if you hand your mechanic the parts, I'm not going to kid you, you're going to pay a little more in labor. Right. And if he's honest, he'll tell you that. I get that at my shop all the time. Same amount of hours to fix it. Except what a, what a lot of people don't realize is, like in the case of my shop and the marine I worked at, we make money selling parts. If you're lucky, labor covers your rent. You know, our profit in most small businesses, we're se we're selling parts. That's how we make our money. And you know, I tell I don't deny that because I have people all the time. Well, you know, I can go online and buy that for, mm -hmm. you know, half of what you're charging me. And I'm, and my usual attitude is no problem go ahead order it but I'm going to charge you the difference between what I would normally make by selling you the part <laughs> and <laughs> unless it falls clean off the vehicle don't bother calling me if there's a problem mm. um, and the other thing is if that part's wrong or defective not only going to be on yeah. you're going to be on the hook to do it twice you're also going to be responsible for the time that that car or boat or whatever is tying up my shop while you're trying to find the right part. And I mean, it sounds like I'm being hard on people, but these are all the reasons I need to make money on parts because this stuff happens all the time. We get defective parts, we get wrong parts regularly, and I'm even talking from the dealers. You know, someone transposes a number or it's boxed wrong. And this is all stuff that's a cost of doing business, and this is why you need to let the mechanic make some money on the parts. And I have no problem with people supplying their own parts as long as they understand that, and as long as I'm making my margins, I don't really, I don't really care. But the other problem is a lot of times people supplying their own parts want to, they want to go down to the cheapest parts store, and then when it doesn't work right, they're blaming me. All right. So that, you know that's a that and that's precisely why I just said if you're going to do that, buy the factory parts, and that takes that out of the equation as far as the quality. 
but also it's I don't recommend doing that every time you have your boat serviced. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying if you carry crucial parts like a spare water pump impeller, you know, most reputable mechanics are gonna understand, okay, I see why, you know, they're gonna know why you did it. Well, the other way of looking at it, if, if you have your own uh, water pump, you're gonna need a spare water pump when this whole thing is over, so you just have, you should buy one from you, and then keep your spare as a spare. Yeah. And Because you never need another spare anyway, right? So. Yeah. Or the other thing you do, I mean, and I've done this for people on cars, is they say, look, I already bought, you know, I keep a spare of this, if it's a common failure item, and I'll usually say, I said, all right, you know what, why don't we put yours in and take the new one, I'll sell you a new one, which you can put for your spare. That way you're rotating the, you know, you're not going to end up with a spare part that's 30 years old. Right. But you know, if you get a good a good mechanic, whether it's car or truck, it generally will work with you. But you just you know you need to be you need to understand that we're all in we're in business to make a living, and a lot of people don't realize labor is only a small part of our you know of our profit margin. And and I can tell you from as a as a small business owner myself that. Customer attitude definitely affects how much they pay. <laughs> I find, I find if people, but well, it, I look at it as I am going to charge people for my time and aggravation of dealing with them. If I have someone who's really tough to deal with, um, I'd rather give a deal to the easygoing people that are just like fix it, you know, no problem. So they'll get the better deals. The guy that comes in and wants, you know, everything, he wants a written estimate, he wants everything up front, basically saying he doesn't trust me. Brand new customers, I'll give them some leeway because they don't know me. But I have certain customers that are just always difficult and their bills will, they'll always be 20% more than the guy who's easy going. Because I'm actually working for that money. I'm charging him for the time I'm spending trying to keep him happy. And I have certain clientele that are fine with that. I have certain clientele that the more I charge them, the happy they are. They equate, they equate more expensive means we did a better job. So when it's, you're calling us be out in the ocean, don't be difficult. Stay on its good side. Yeah. I'm not panicking. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't, watch don't panic when he hangs up. I want you to help me. I'll take the help. If you call me when I'm out on the golf course, your bill's doubled immediately. <laughs> I'll call you to go golfing. <laughs> Will your phone bark? Huh? Yeah. Will your phone bark? <laughs> That's how he knows what calls to ignore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. I've got my, my wife and kids, uh, they all have their own. I have, like every, I've got separate ringtones for. Well, actually, I don't have ringtones for my my immediate my close friends and my family. Everybody else, it's just the generic. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so you're gonna do the homework for ten. Should we do the homework? Or? Uh -huh. Huh? No, we're okay. Never mind. Yeah, do the homework for ten, and uh, we're gonna do homework beginning next week, right? Just class eight.